First, I'd like to just start by um, commending the organisers, CAHG and Scottish Community uh, Council for Archives, on organising today's event. Um, particularly welcome to all of you after 13 years of uh, consistency in this, so that's commendable. And welcome to all of you to Glasgow. Um, what took you so long? Where you been? This is within, don't you know, the Scots invented the modern world, right? <laughs> So welcome, no, so welcome to, welcome to a, a lovely Scottish summer, as you've probably <laughs> noticed already. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honour to, to be here today with, with all of you, and particularly as a, as a non-academic or formal historian or an archivist, I, I find myself in this very uh, somewhat rather awkward position um, to deliver a keynote at such a conference uh, with such esteemed uh, guests and specialists. Uh, I am, as I mentioned by profession, a finance chap. Uh, and approximately 10 years ago, uh, I set up Colourful Heritage Project, which has now grown to become uh, the, the, the UK's largest ar uh, video archive of South Asian uh, migrants. Um, at this point, I get it, you're wondering, what is this finance guy doing here, right? Um, and I hope that will become clearer during the course of my presentation. But just for the record at the outset, it's not because, in case you think so, I could not get any other job actually can, I do know my finance. So, when we were requested to, to, to do this keynote, um, we were asked actually to focus more on the strategic rather than the specific. Um, whilst I will refer to some of the detail of what Colourful Heritage has done um, over the last 10 years, I'm sure you'll find more detail on that uh, on our website and, and Facebook and so on. But what I will use is the remainder of this speech to very much focus on and tease out the, the strategic decisions that we made along our journey, which I hope will be a lot more fruitful and beneficial to all of you in your individual organisations uh, and, 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 and your particular journey in, in the archive space as well. Ours at Colourful Heritage is a peculiar experience and it's peppered with many challenges and, and some amazing successes. We have genuinely uh, uncovered what we believe to be a unique migrant story um, that's you know that's special to and, and unique to Scotland to the city of Glasgow um, and that's evidenced by a series of, of, uh, uh, of, of facts that I'll, I'll present um, you might wonder you might have already started to wonder why is it that Glasgow has made the UK's largest video repository of South Asian migrants surely if you went to Bradford Birmingham East London you would find that that would be there, but it's not, it's Glasgow. So let me start from the beginning. Um, why did it all start and where did we start from? Very simply, it was a group of friends around a decade ago having coffee and discussing, and we thought, what a wonderful idea. Someone should do this, you know? All these early generation who migrated, most of them have passed away, we've got a few left. These are legends, you know, why doesn't someone do it? And I was the, the, the sad punter who said, yeah, that's great, let's do this. And everyone said, yeah, we'll be with you, Omar, just take the lead. And as you do in life so many times, you start taking the journey, you turn around, and you realize you're kind of sad, standing on your own. You know? <laughs> what happens here? Where's everyone else gone, right? They're like, we, we don't know what you do anyway in the finance world, so you don't really have a job. Just, just go do this. <laughs> okay, fine. Um, so the journey started. And as uh, Irene mentioned in, in, in her remarks, opening remarks, uh, it was, I was personally had recently just read a book then by Professor Carl Pillimer, who had gone and interviewed um, around 1,500 people in the U.S. in the 60s to 70s and 70s to 80s, 80s to 90s and, and plus, and effectively whittled all of that lived experience using Aristotle's concept of phronesis. He whittled that down to guidance, messages that you could give to people in their 20s, people in their 30s, people in their 40s, and all of that was experienced from their direct journeys. And he summarized it beautifully, I felt, in, in that book. And I thought we had a similar opportunity here to do the same with our forefathers and mothers who had migrated across to, to Scotland you know, from the early 1930s onwards. Um, and we felt that their stories were particularly pertinent because they're relatable, but also they're considering everything else that's going on in the current climate. Uh, we've got a small issue of Brexit in this country from those from the US, you know. <laughs> I'm sure you've got your own issues, but that's a whole other point. Um, it's, 
it was it was now more pertinent than ever with the anti-migrant narrative that we were hearing that was arising um, that actually we, we, we unpacked the story and we said okay let's find out more and that was key for us that whatever we did in this process we made sure it was pertinent to 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 the younger people today and I'll come back to that we also noticed within this context that there was a lack of archive information and I remember we met maybe eight nine years ago um, we realized in Glasgow that the Italian community had their archives, the Irish community had their archives, the Jewish community had their ar archives, but there was no archive representing the South Asian community, and they were the single largest um, ethnic minority group in, in Glasgow. So we realized there was a gap there. Third thing was also the realization of a lack of representation and engagement in the museums um, across the, the different venues that Glasgow Museums had. Some of the artifacts that were there on display didn't really represent the community. We found the community, this was told to us from the, from the museums, from the head of museums, that the community is not, the BME community is not engaging uh, as well as it should be uh, in proportionate terms with, with the, the assets of the museums. The, the fourth thing which was extremely powerful was that I realized that this particular project has a time fuse. Right. There are many noble, great activities going on out there in, 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 in social causes, but this particular one, if it was not done now, those stories were gone. When people pass away, the story's gone and the journey's gone with them. And this was an opportunity to really capture these stories and have the first-hand accounts of them. It was an opportunity as well, we felt. We felt it was an opportunity for the community to tell their story by themselves. It's a story of the community, for, by the community, and working in partnership with other stakeholders like Glasgow Museums and Scottish Government and so on. So that was a unique opportunity as well, that we could actually capture that ourselves and tell our own journey. So 50 years, 100 years from now, when people look back and they talk about South Asians and Muslims in Scotland, is the narrative going to be cannibalized by terrorism? That's all they were, terrorists, and 90% of the uh, narrative is that. Or is it actually a broader, more holistic, more balanced perspective? And that balance being written from people from within the community, from that lens, as a very specific uh, ontological lens to that. And, and, and the sixth and final contextual factor for us when we started this, for me personally, was actually, um, as Iron had mentioned, I, I, I think that for me, it's, it's personal to myself, but there's that desire and, and wish to have some kind of social purpose in your existence, you know, adding back to society. Um, and I just felt, be it inspired by your belief, be it inspired by your social conscious, whatever that is, I think, uh, I, I feel that, I, uh, that, that many people have this desire to leave the world a better place. Um, and. Having, having moved away down to the city for, for over a decade with, with, with Ernest and Young in London, coming back gave me that opportunity to, to do something. And, and that's something which is very, for me, profound. You know, I believe that you know, all of us, all of us in this room, all of us in this, in this great city and, and, and this planet, I believe you all have a responsibility to give something back. Everyone has an amazing talent in them and something they can add that they can give back to make the world a better place, no matter what their background is. And I think the fact that you've got a finance guy here speaking at an archive conference uh, and doing heritage work proves that point. And this was a city I grew up in that we so fondly call Las Vegas, you know, um, and, and is very much part of my home and my identity. So the journey uh, begins. We decided to build our work on three uh, core pillars capture celebrate inspire capture number one we wanted to document these stories and we decided to use a video format now we could have gone and just listened and written and published this in a three star plus journal or in some you know heritage magazine or so on but we decided specifically to do this via video and there was a reason for that video not only allows it uh, to, to capture the information, but it also allows to capture some of the emotion in their faces, in the tone of their voices, which, uh, which, 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 is, which you can't do justice to really, unless you're very 
you know, a very talented writer. Um, it's really hard to, to, to really capture that in, in, in the written format. And we also knew that young people, because if you remember I said at the beginning, this has to be relevant to society, to the next generations. We knew that they prefer engaging with YouTube. They're not going to go to the library and pick up a journal or pick up a magazine on heritage. Guess what? It's just not happening. You know, Very rare, if at all. Um, and no one had done this. No one had done this before. Of course, now we've got cameras on our phones. There's, there's the availability of this stuff. So maybe it would have been harder 20 years ago. You can publish it on your own channel on YouTube. But now we've got these, these, these facilities. And, and we felt now was a unique time for us to actually do this. All of our videos are online at colorfulheritage.com, 24-7 um, access. It's a bit of a challenge because you take a one hour raw, fo raw footage, one, one and a half hour interview, you have to compress it down to roughly 12 to 14 minutes. Um, but we have all the raw footage as well, if everyone, anyone ever wants that, any budding PhD students or any uh, specialists, that's all available as, as well. But it's fully uh, accessible to, to, to everyone. Within the interviews, we asked them four questions. One was on migration. How did they get here, that journey, that experience? Number two was on entrepreneurship. Number three was on family life. And number four was around identity. How do they describe themselves? How do they see themselves? And over the course of those four open questions, we unpacked and uncovered some fascinating uh, insights. Uh, for me personally, it was an absolute honor, um, at one of the highlights of my life, I would say, to have had the honor to sit with these amazing individuals who maybe so often are left quietly in the corner, 80-year-olds plus, in the corner, be it in the Gurdwara, be it in the mosque, or be it at home, you know, just left alone in the corner doing, you know, what they're doing. For me, it was an absolute honor uh, and one of the most inspiring moments in my life, uh, something that brings you to tears. Um, when you listen to their journey and the sacrifices that they made and the challenges they had to deal with and yet how they landed on their feet after all of that. Um, it's something that actually helps motivate uh, you, I feel, across your life, across all the facets of your life and has helped me immensely in, in, in that, I would say. Second was um, celebrate. Actually, let's use this opportunity to thank them. Me as a South Asian, Scottish or Scottish Asian, you know, I can have access to religious uh, places of worship. I can get halal food. I can get all of these things. And why? Because someone came beforehand and developed that and facilitated that. So for us, it was an opportunity to thank all of them. Um, what we refer to as Desi legends or, or Pradesi heroes or Punjabi peddlers, as, as you said. This project is really all about them. And our opportunity to, to, to honor them. And that's something that remains in our culture very strongly. Uh, we might be diaspora migrant, but respect for the elders and honoring their commitment is something that remains very strong within that culture. All of the, the contributions, as, as I mentioned before, is because someone was a trailblazer and took that uh, thing to it. We heard from them the, the stories in the early days, they would get harassed by their neighbors when they would cook a curry because of the smell of the onions. So the neighbors would come and harass them, abuse them. Fast forward, you know, 50 years, curry is the number one selling food in, in the whole of Britain, right? And guess what? Chicken tikka masala was invented in Scotland as well. So it's a fascinating contradiction, you know, where you've got 50 years ago, the police being called harassment and abuse for cutting onions. And now today it's a multi, you know, billion dollar industry across the UK. I think one of the other important things here to remember is the context within which these peddlers, predominantly in Scotland, uh, who came from the Punjab region, which was a slightly different migration pattern here in Scotland than it is south of the border, um, where they came from. And that makes this story all the more fascinating. They're coming off the back of what? They've been colonized for 200 years, yeah? They were striving and struggling for their independence. They were coming into Europe, devastated by the two wars, yeah? in which, by the way, the British Indian Army played a huge role to protect this land. There was an awfully kind of mentally scarring, bloody horrific partition 
between India and Pakistan as well. Um, all of these things, when you contextualize this as the backdrop, actually makes the achievements of these individuals all the more uh, commendable. And the final pillar of our work was to inspire, uh, and that was to inspire young people of all backgrounds across Scottish and British society, not just South Asian background, but of all backgrounds, that what can they learn, what can they benefit from these particular individuals. So this is not just archive focused, in, 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 this, is, this is very much, I would say, forward looking in using heritage as a way to address contemporary social challenges. At the time, 2010, you might remember off the back of the financial crisis, austerity politics, austerity policies. If you want to become an entrepreneur, well, who do you want to talk to for some advice in becoming an entrepreneur? Well, why don't you speak to these people? Turned up with a few shillings in their socks and managed to establish themselves as phenomenal entrepreneurs, the hard work ethic, the not giving up, and so on. And again, as I mentioned earlier, there's, there was enough negativity out there in society that we're seeing today, the rise of um, divisive anti-migrant narrative, the rise of Islamophobia. Um, and we didn't dismiss this, we understood this was important and as that has developed even more, it's made the importance of our work even more, um, I, I would say, having a greater purpose to tackle some of these issues using heritage and using our archives to, to do such and these stories of migration. That we can actually, and we found a beautiful narrative in our work, and how the early migrants came to this country were welcomed by the local Scots, adopted that identity and, and, and contributed considerably and continue to do so to this country. And that's where we feel we can use heritage to address some of these contemporary social issues and positively bring people together on what we have in common. All right, so that's a bit of, of, of about the why and the how. Um, so what have we achieved in, in the last nine, nine and a half years? So over 100 videos that have been recorded, as I mentioned, these were inclusive of men and women. And, and we made a conscious effort not just to get those people in the community who are always the community leaders, but actually, and have done really well, be it in civic or uh, in political life or, in, or in, in, in their businesses, but actually to get a proper wide spectrum of everyone, um, be it an individual who's on the buses and so on, or be it an individual who was in a, in a corner shop or retired as a peddler, whatever that was, we wanted to get a broad coverage and get even get, get, get everyone who may be perceived as Audrey alongside those who are perceived in, uh, by society or by, by the community as, as leaders, so leaders, but all of them we felt were equal and all of them had an amazing story to tell. So that was the first thing. Uh, to achieve that, we, we must have held over 40 community engagement meetings and workshops and events in Glasgow and Dundee and in Edinburgh. The focus was on Glasgow, but we went across to Edinburgh and Dundee as well. Uh, we showcased our work. We were invited by the British Council to showcase this in Lahore in, in Pakistan. Lahore as a city is actually twinned with Glasgow, so that was, was, it was a lovely uh, Heritage Now event that the British Council had organised. Uh, and we've also been down to London with the British Council as well, showcasing our work there. Uh, we entered into a fantastic partnership with Glasgow Museums, and that resulted in, in two major achievements. First, with Irene and her team at the Mitchell Library in creating the Bashir Man archive that you see there. That's named after Mr. Bashir Man. He's approximately 95 years old. Uh, he is the UK's first Muslim who was elected to public office as a, as a councillor in 1970. Um, and we named the archive after him. He, he actually maintained a lot of his, his stuff, uh, which he indexed his documents, his pictures, and so on, which was a phenomenal source of, of data. Um, we launched this in, um, I mean, we launched this in 2014. Ago, yeah, 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 and it's housed at the Mitchell Library um, and it contains photographs, letters, and all sorts of official documents. It has other community members' information in there as, as well. The second thing we did is we launched the first of its kind, Glaswege Asians exhibition. It's meant to be a play on words, by the way, Glaswege Asians. I know it didn't really work too well, but <laughs> we tried. Um, uh, that's based at the Scotland Street School Museum. So if you're up visiting Scotland or Glasgow, then you should definitely try and pop down. Many people think, well, why did Bashir Man do this in 1970? Oh, it was a one off, it's an outlier. It's outside the bell curve, we can write it off. But actually, fast forward to 97, you find the UK's first 
Muslim Member of Parliament elected from Glasgow as well and go back to 1930s, we were in Dundee just a couple of months ago, Dr. Janti Das was elected as a councillor in 1936. Celtic had a South Asian player, <coughs> Abdul, um, Abdul Salim, playing in the 1930s. Celtic being one of the top tier European teams, although some people locally might disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't bring sectarianism into this. Yeah, we got over that. That's right. <laughs> So phenomenal, phenomenal artifacts are there. And we also unpack the story of an amazing regiment from the British Indian Army, the only regiment that actually served in Britain from World War II, evacuated from Dunkirk, as you would have noticed on the movie. No, sorry, it was whitewashed, if I remember, yeah. Uh, um, actually ended up in Brecon Brecons and ended up in Scotland. And the largest grave site of those soldiers is up in Kunusi, and we'll touch more on that later. But it's a fantastic, fantastic exhibition which uh, the Glasgow Museum's team have put together. It's now uh, turned into a permanent exhibition and you must go down and, and, and visit that. Uh, we, 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 took, we laid a wreath in George Square um, on Remembrance Service. It was the first time ever a, a, a wreath was laid to commemorate the contributions of the British Indian Army uh, during the two world wars. That's nearly four million soldiers on a voluntary basis, largely. Um, who served to protect Britain, 2.5 in World War II, 1.5 in, in World War I. Um, and Glasgow's Remembrance Service is the second largest in the country uh, of all of the UK, and never before had anyone laid a wreath because people simply didn't know. They just didn't know the story. It hadn't been talked about, hadn't been captured in our, uh, in our uh, curriculum, in our schools, uh, education uh, curriculum and so on. Uh, it just wasn't there. People from their own South Asian community did not know that their forefathers had fought, their grandparents had fought. Um, we published a, a chapter in a, in a book, uh, sorry, we wrote a chapter in a book published by Edinburgh University Press and Professor Peter Hopkins, uh, specifically unpacking the identity part of our questions, which was feeling Scottish and being Muslim, findings from the Colourful Heritage Project. And we've collaborated with a whole bunch of, of other partners. As I said at the beginning, there was a group of us, and then it ended up in a smaller group, and then a smaller group, and then an individual, you know? So uh, I think you'll get a lot of pleasantries when you're doing this type of work from the community. You'll get a lot of, uh, um, you know, a, a lot of, you know, yeah, we wish you well, go ahead, but it can be very, very lonely when you have to do this uh, on, on your own or just with a couple of you. Um, I think from that, what we learned is that even when you're on your own, don't give up, persevere, get the job done. And this is beyond just a day job per se. This is something which is a lot more powerful. Funding. I've operated, I do this in a pro bono capacity. We did not get funded from anyone in the first few years. And the problem we had in, on top of the normal challenges for funding is a lot of the money, if not 90% of the money for heritage, is from the lottery fund. Now, if you go to the Muslim community and you tell them you've taken money from the lottery fund, you're going to get dismissed. They're not going to engage with you. They're not going to tell you your stories. So it was a double whammy for us. Um, so, big, huge challenge. However, the irony is now after nine years, I turn back and I look in retrospect and I say, actually, it wasn't the funding that we needed. It was the passion of the people and the, the commitment that you get. And so often when you do get funded, and I'm a finance guy, I understand this, you have to meet particular targets that forces you and can actually sometimes shackle you. We ended up doing the archive, we ended up doing the, the Glaswich Asians exhibition with Glasgow Museum, which was never actually in our initial plan, it was just making the videos. So the fact that we had the space to do that, I think we have managed to achieve a lot more uh, in a way without <laughs> that funding in the early days. Later on we did get support, which was much welcome. What we did, we did it professionally, I, I, much to sometimes the dismay of my colleagues and the team. Uh, I, I just basically applied the same process I did at Ernest & Young and, and, and to, to this and people say this is not private sector Omar, you can't do this. Yeah? Duncan, your colleague, was like shocked when we were like pushing for deadlines. I mean, working with museum guys on deadlines is fascinating, you know, it's like, <laughs> what? You what? Deadlines? Wait, wait, which planet are you on, right? So I, I very quickly became persona non grata, but I just believed in one thing. When you're doing work for the community, you don't do second best, you don't turn up late, you don't be passive, you don't do the same thing that I'm brainwashed into doing, being smartly kind of planning the, the activities, being uber efficient with that, and being very focused on the outcomes is what we did, so there was no cutting corners. Um, and finally, there was a piece around the kind of ontological questions, um, 
that we had to navigate, which was really difficult. The BME community, three lovely wee letters of BAME make it four. Guess what? That is a cocktail diaspora. <laughs> you know, it does not fit in four letters at all whatsoever. There's a whole sectarian divide, religious divide, and so on and so forth. And I had a lot of challenges. What do you mean South Asian and Muslim? Is it just for Muslims or is it for everyone? What is it? Well, actually, we had to accommodate everyone. And I made that conscious decision. That meant I got a lot of backlash from the, the community I come from. And there was a lot of suspicion to deal with. But I just made that decision. And it's sometimes harder to do that if you want to be inclusive and you want to engage with women and young people and, and seek community in different sects. You will have to go out 10 times harder to get that within this uh, BME community than just doing it very easily with, oh, that's fine, I know the Pakistani Muslim community, very easy, I'll, I'll run with that, you know. Um, actually, it's much harder, um, but being inclusive is, is critical, and that's why when we laid the wreath in George Square, we had a Hindu lady, we had a young uh, Muslim girl, and an elderly Sikh veteran doing that all together. Um, so that was something that, that, that we, that we learnt uh, along the way. And indeed, that was something that was echoed uh, by what we, what we picked up in the videos from the early migrants, how they looked outwards and how they were inclusive and how they were very friendly and supported one another regardless of their religious or sectarian uh, background. Um, I think that was beautifully, it's encapsulated in the beautiful quote by the late Bashir Ahmed, who is the Scottish government's very first uh, BME member of parliament, who, who said uh, very poignantly uh, at the SNP party conference, um, uh, he said, it's not where we are coming from, but it's where we're going together that matters. So that's really some of the stories and the learning that I've managed, um, that, that, that we picked up along the way. And I hope I've managed to provide some strategic tips and tactical advice, as that's what I was <laughs> mandated to do. Um, and I hope some of that you can use in, in your organizations. Um, it, I think in conclusion, and apologies, I'm running slightly over, and it's... Uh, there's a, lovely, there's a lovely saying we have in, in the commercial world that says culture eats strategy for breakfast. It was a phrase which was originated by Peter Drucker and made famous by the president, Mark Field, president of Ford. Uh, it's an absolute reality, but however, I think that's in big organizations, but in small organizations, like many of your archive organizations will be in heritage organizations, I think passion eats operating frameworks for breakfast. That passion that all of you have for what you're doing is what's going to be your biggest asset. And I think that single-minded determination, being prepared to sacrifice and go against the tide is what's going to be your core success. Um, for us at Colourful Heritage, um, I just really wanted to conclude uh, with, with, with two last things. One is um, the team. There's no way this was going to be done without a phenomenal team who've worked pro bono or worked part-time, have gone way above the call of duty. So if you don't mind, I'm going to ask Shazia, Sakib, Tarek and Aman, can you guys just stand up please for a second? And if you can all just join me in giving them a, a round of applause. <laughs> really cannot uh, um, thank you enough to all of you for, for, for everything, putting up with me and seeing through the project and everything that you've done. Uh, it's really been phenomenal. Um, I think on reflection, Colourful Heritage is a great example of what a few committed, sincere and competent people can achieve with a great idea, good partners and smart execution. We may not have changed the course of history, but we have certainly gone a long way to document it and address the archival silence, our history told by our community. This, I have no doubt, will be a priceless asset for all of Glasgow, Scotland and the UK and the generations to come. Asian, native, Scottish, and thank you very much for your patience. Thanks.